You've been dreaming of this since the day your father died. By Jupiter's beard, when will you finally understand it never was about you or your sad excuse for a family? I had plans, great plans for Rome. The Republic is crumbling, but the establishment always hates the revolutionary. Your father was a spy, a tool of the state. He fought for the status quo. I was forced to eliminate him to save Rome. Maybe. What's clear is that somebody must take charge. The point was never becoming the king. It was that Rome needed a king in the first place. Someone who could cut through the endless dog shit coming out of the Senate. The blatant tribalism, the spiteful self-sabotage, the bribery and greed. We need someone who is willing and able to make difficult and unpopular decisions. Clearly. It doesn't matter if you kill me. In fact, I'm content. You are clearly a better choice to lead Rome. It seems the park I intended my role to be in molding the first emperor of Rome. When I am dead, your reign will begin. It's finally over. It almost seems unreal. The beginning of what? You have violated every single rule we set out to protect in the first place. You have killed Romans. Senators, even. Kaiso was right. You do sound like Lurko. We must submit ourselves to the judgment of the Senate, as we discussed. Only then can we begin to undo some of the damage we have caused. Are you stupid? Did you hit your head in battle? We will all be killed! Not all of us. He will probably be condemned to death indeed, but we will not be punished as harshly. We should not get punished at all! We should take over Rome and live like kings! The Anira is right. Surrender will only lead to execution. But... Magister... Surely morals dictate that he should surrender. Doing anything else would be immoral and thus make him a lesser man. He is like my own child. He would be a lesser man, but a man who is alive. They will not just let us go. We all attacked. Well, I certainly do not want to be executed. May I remind you what you have just said about the expected behavior of a moral individual? I don't consider myself a particularly moral man yet. I don't care about the philosophy of it. If you stay here, more people will die and the chaos will never end. We don't have to turn ourselves in if you're afraid of the consequences. I'm sure Cleopatra will protect you if you flee to Egypt. Don't do this. I'm warning you. I did not help you stop a would-be king only to replace him with another. My debt to you is repaid. I certainly don't owe you any support if you try to overthrow the Republic. It's clear there is no changing your mind. Perhaps this was your goal all along. Well then, this is goodbye. For what it's worth, I hope you rule the city well. Wale. Wale, my friends. Take care of him, Tabat. You are always welcome here. If you change your mind... So it was that the Republic of Rome, which had long rested on an unsteady foundation, was finally torn to the ground. From the rubble rose a new, strong empire. Though the institution of the Senate was maintained for centuries to come, all power was stripped from it and granted almost in full to the new ruler of Rome.
From Lost Sion, to Legionarius, to Legatus, and finally to Emperor. The first citizen of Rome had broken with all traditions and betrayed the faith of many during his meteoric rise to power. But as much as those who once held power now loathed their new ruler, he was greatly beloved by the people of Rome, for whom life universally improved under his rule. As he built Rome up from a regional power to an empire spanning the continent, he came to be revered almost like a god. Old Cineros, the emperor's most beloved Servus. Though he was free, he would not leave the side of his Dominus until the day he died. He lived many more years in luxury and leisure, with access to the finest works of philosophy, visited by great scholars from near and far. Freed of his domestic duties, he even found the time to author a great work of his own, a treatise on the topic of regret and forgiveness. Though its contents are lost to time, we must imagine that its completion brought him great satisfaction. Caeso left Rome with Lucia and their daughter. They traveled to Africa as Caeso remembered the warm nights and the lush Nile Delta fondly. Here they found a place to settle and made a peaceful home for their family. Though their relationship was distant at first, their devotion to their child drew them together, and their affection for each other grew stronger through the years. To his surprise, Caeso took well to fatherhood, and soon he and Lucia had many more children. Despite her redemption in the eyes of the law, Calida at first left Rome to travel. Exhausted from her role in bringing about the fall of the Republic, she needed time away to clear her mind and ground herself again. Eventually, she returned to settle down in Rome, where her connection to its new dictator made her more safe and free to live her life on her own terms than she had ever been before. Still, she remained distant from her old friends and she never again got involved in politics, nor warfare. Bestia stayed by the side of the Emperor of Rome, becoming the leader of a new Imperial Guard. Uncompromisingly loyal, he was an enforcer as much as he was a protector, and eventually he became one of the most feared men in the Empire. As soon as things had quieted down, Bestia traveled to Africa once more to look for his sister. He did find her and bring her home, and she lived happily there for the rest of her life. Deonera stayed by her beloved's side, enjoying the life of luxury that Roman society could afford. Though she would never feel quite at home in Rome, it seems nothing could trouble her as long as they had each other. Eventually, they did make the journey to Shervia together, where she reconnected with her family. Claudiana lived for many more years. She had many friends in Rome, and her life was peaceful and comfortable until her final days. On her deathbed, she revealed that she had once been very close indeed with Lucullus, and that indeed the true family name of her children was Licinia. Cato withdrew from the Senate sometime during Rome's transition from Republic to Empire. The shift in the power balance that he had helped facilitate never sat well with him, and his disappointment in himself haunted him for the rest of his life. He never again entered politics, but nor did he ever join any of the early attempts to overthrow the new dictator. It seemed Cato's convictions had been taken from him. Cicero remained in the Senate even after the institution had become a mere shell of what it once was. He saw his purpose as the voice of dissent, the most prominent leader of the opposition to Rome's new ruler. Though it could be argued that he was unsuccessful in saving or restoring the Republic, there is little doubt that his work brought about a more just empire. Defeated once more by Rome, Mithridates escaped to the lands north of the Black Sea, in the hope that he could raise a new army. But the locals soon rebelled against his rule. Incapable of taking his own life by poison, in the end, Mithridates died by the sword of his bodyguard. With Zenobia in charge of Mosia, it became once more a peaceful part of the Roman province of Asia Minor, 
With her focus on trade and strong ties to the neighboring regions, her people enjoyed a period of great prosperity. Without the leadership of Damianos, the rebellion of his gladiators soon spiraled out of control, beginning what became known as the Servile War. Escaped slaves terrorized the Roman citizens throughout Thracia until the wealthy senator Crassus brutally defeated them and crucified thousands along the road towards Rome. Lunia's death sent Nazamanes spiraling into a fractious conflict as greedy elders from minor tribes attempted to fill the void her passing had left behind. Though Queen Cleopatra attempted to bring the region under control, her attentions were too divided, the conflict too great for her to manage. Rome was forced to send more legions to enforce peace and stability with an iron fist. Though Africa Proconsularis eventually saw peace again, the traditions and culture of the Berber population were lost forever. Queen Cleopatra Philopator was, from the day of her coronation, a greatly beloved Queen of Egypt. Revered and admired by the population, she spent many of her days traveling up and down the Nile to visit her subjects and address their troubles and concerns. Under her rule, Egypt remained a powerful and prosperous nation and a strong ally of Rome. The fruits of the Nile flowed freely to the people of the Republic. After traveling all across Africa for many years, going wherever her instincts took her, Raya eventually returned to Memphis and to the service of Tenair at the Temple of Ubasti. When her mentor passed away, Raya naturally assumed the mantle as High Priestess of the Cat Goddess. Though the old faith was dwindling, she was greatly beloved by many, and her temple prospered, always home to many, many, many cats. With Dewitiacus once more assuming rulership of the Idwe, the tribe maintained a strong alliance with Rome, and through it, they greatly prospered. With the aid of the Idwe, Gallia slowly unified under Roman rule, and civilization soon began to creep into those lands in the form of paved roads, aqueducts, and fortified Roman towns. In his old age, did the Druid ever regret hastening the absorption and suppression of his own faith and culture? We will never know. The defeat and death of Workingatorix had reduced the once mighty Awerni tribe to a myriad bickering chieftains. Without his vision, his charisma, and his resolve, there was no unifying figure to rally around, and no way for Gallia to resist their slow but inevitable assimilation into Rome. Perhaps if Wakingatorix had lived, some of their culture or religion might have survived in some form. But surely they must be grateful that civilization at last was brought to their lands. In this work, I have done my best to recount the history of this fascinating period, truthfully and accurately. As I have scoured the sources and spoken to many who claimed to have heard the story from someone who was there at the time, one thing that has stood out to me is the pivotal moments along the way where our story could have turned out very differently. Could the Republic have continued without an Emperor? I believe so, if the Legatus had been willing to make the necessary sacrifices. But it is clear that the personal cost would have been great, as would the risk to the highly troubled Republic in the absence of leadership. In many ways, Rome was already an Empire in want of an Emperor. One should always take care when second-guessing historical figures with the benefit of hindsight. Here in the present, there will never truly be a way for you to know how you might have acted if you had lived in the past. Nor can you ever be certain how history will remember you.